Colossians chapter 3, verse 22 through chapter 4, verse 1. And this is on Christians in the workplace. We just covered marriage and how that was to be a testimony. And then raising your children and how that was to be a testimony. You see, God's method in turning the world upside down, I love that where Paul and Barnabas, they said, oh, here comes these guys to our city who's been turning the world upside down. And indeed, they were turning the Roman Empire upside down. And eventually, the Roman Empire would be conquered from within when Christianity, rather than the pagan worship, was overthrown. And the majority of the Romans began to worship Jesus, that kingdom that demonic Roman kingdom couldn't stand. And so the, the witness would be as all of a sudden you see husbands in this Roman culture, in this pagan culture, and all over it was large. All of a sudden they're, they're learning that the husband isn't to be this rough, mean guy who's the dictator of his household and do what I say, woman, or I'll slap you, and do what I say, kids, and... You know, this was their model that, you know, when you become a dad, the switch happens or a husband, the switch happens and you become this tyrant. But all of a sudden now, no, you need to love your wife and cherish your wife. See her as the weaker vessel and, 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 and understand who she is as a woman and, and come along and the two of you partner and submit one to another in the fear of God. And so all of a sudden, when a guy becomes a Christian, they're noticing how he treats his wife and, and the wife treats her husband and, and it would be a light like a city sitting on the hill. And of course, with parents, again, the dads weren't connecting with the kids as often pagan cultures do. And all of a sudden now, it's like, no, 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 dads, you need to admonish your kids, teach your kids, instruct them, just like in Judaism, while you sit down, while you rise up, while you walk along the way, teach them to know the Lord, disciple them. And don't, don't make them angry. Don't, don't, don't use that pagan style of being a dad, being rough with them and ordering them and, and not connecting and having that relationship with them. And boy, I, I didn't realize through the years how many little insights I had. It took an hour and six minutes last week. Sorry. Um, I'm, I'm going to make up for it this week. Um, let's preach an extra short sermon. I, I don't know. We'll see. Um, but the idea is, again, as the world sees this dad and this mom and how they're treating their kids, how they're connecting with their kids, and, and how the, the kids are, you know, in no way terrorized by their dad or afraid of their dad. But they're seeing him as this loving shepherd that, wow, just the contrast between the Roman Empire that's been and now this new way of living. It was beautiful. It was loving. It was connecting. And so now, one of the places we spend most of our time, and that is the workplace. And again, equally so, as we walk in sanctification as Christians, that you would turn the world upside down in the workplace, even if you are a slave, which is huge. So we read here in Colossians 3, 22 through 4, 1, Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of your inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done. There is no partiality. In chapter 4, verse 1, Masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have masters in heaven. Now, as you read that passage, the first question that often people have 
is why is chapter 4, verse 1, not verse 26 of chapter 3? That, why, why did it have a chapter break there? You, you know, Jesus didn't put in the chapter and verse breaks, right? Actually, there was a guy by the name of Robert Stephanus in the 1200s who made the chapter divisions. And he typically did it from going from one church to another church to another church preaching. And most of it he did on horseback or donkey back. And the, the saying is, whether it's true or not, I don't know, that he often felt that the, when the horse stumbled and he made a mark, that that was the Holy Spirit leading him to put a mark there. No joke. And so that's how the mark got there in the chapter division. And then later on in the 1500s, a guy by the name of Stephanus, uh, Robert Stephanus. So you have Stephen Langton uh, in the 1200s and Robert Stephanus. The reason I can easily think of it, because you have Stephen and you have Stephanus. So you sort of have a Stephen on each one of these, right? Robert Stephanus in the 1200s and then Stephen Langton. Um, or the opposite, Stephen Langton in the 1200s, Robert Stephanus with the verses, the chapters and the verse divisions. Well, it's talking about bond servants, and that, you know, it's such a can of worms today, because right now people are saying all kinds of things about slavery, and uh, there, there is a huge uproar in the community because a big part of it is they see the fault lies not with the white man only, but with Christians. Because the Christians use the Bible to justify their enslaving the black man. And so they're equally against Christianity. And so we sort of got to talk about that giant elephant in the room. And... Um, the word bond slave, it actually comes out of the Old Testament. We're going to look at that a minute when we look at the Old Testament and what it says about slavery. But, you know, in a general sense, you could, you could just say this is talking about slaves. But you got to understand, in, in, in relation to how slavery worked in the Roman Empire, it was very much like an employee-employer relationship. It, the way it worked. And we'll see that at the end where it says, hey, and you masters, give to your slaves what's just and fair, talking about their salary as slaves. So it was a little bit of a di different dynamic than the slavery in America. Matter of fact, the slavery in America was not like any slavery at all in the Bible. It was very much night and day. But historically, slavery in most cultures happened through conquest. So when they conquered another country, they made the people of that other country, they killed off the threats and took typically the children mainly, but some of the younger women and brought them in and made them slaves in their country. And then sometimes people would con you know, conquer them and they would take the slaves of that country as well as the people. And now they're all slaves of the next country, but it wasn't typically racial. You, you often would have slaves in, in a country of very mixed race, typically not that country. <laughs> so in the Roman Empire, if you were a Roman citizen, you wouldn't be a slave. But if you weren't a Roman citizen, you very much uh, have the possibility, whatever the color of your skin, whatever nationality, wherever you were raised, you can be a slave through conquest. And then there's indentured servants. Most of Americans got here that way. They were paid the passage and paid, uh, the land was bought and, and tools and all of that. All they had to do is work the land for X amount of time. And then they were free now to go get their own land and start their own life. But until they paid off the, the money that was spent to get them to America, uh, they were indentured servants. And that was a very common happening in many countries even to this day. Um, and then there's some people, again, that were slaves at the conquest. You have a slave, you can sell a slave. So often people would become a slave just through being sold. And that's typically how it happened in, in our country. You had 
the African tribes warring and the African tribes, they made slaves of each other for hundreds and hundreds of years before we ever knew Africa existed. And so when a, what they learned though is they conquer one village and take the people and make them slaves, they can take them to the coast and and sell them to all over the world for a a lot of money. So now it wasn't about getting slaves for themselves as much as it was taking them to the coast. And it was typically black men selling black men to those on the coast that would ship them all over the world. And so the slavery we had in America was probably mostly those who were slaves through conquest and then also sold uh, into slavery. And one of the reasons it was able to flourish for as long as it did in our country is because of the theory of Darwin. Darwin's theory of evolution, a lot of people believe that the black man was less evolved than your typical European white man. And that was a big part of it. We were not really oppressing another human being. We're oppressing somebody on the chain of becoming a human being. Um, But when we look at slavery in the Bible, and again, did our forefathers use the Bible to justify their sin? Absolutely they did, but they didn't really look at what it said, or if they did, they ignored it. Because when we look at the slavery in the Bible, it definitely wasn't racial. It wasn't just one race of people as it was here in America. And um, I'm not going to go in depth on this. I I will actually be doing that when we are teaching through Leviticus and Numbers. I will go at that time. But you got to understand, when God brought the children out of Egypt... And this talks about it. We're going to see that he, he did not want slavery in the Jewish culture. He did not want divorce in the Jewish culture. He did not want polygamy in the Jewish culture. But the law explains that out of concession, God allowed it. In other words, he bent the branch as far as he could bend it at that moment. But if God bent it further... You know, he told them, you got to get rid of all of your idols. I won't share my godship with any pagan idol and any pagan religion. You can't mix your pagan religions that you've known for 400 years in Egypt. You can't bring them in to this new relationship with you. Very hard thing. We see them having idols from Egypt hundreds of years later. They couldn't get rid of them. So there was a lot of things that God just said, hey, won't move from here. But yet he saw that if he pushed it any further at this time, the branch would break. They would just say, okay, if you're not going to allow a polygamy, I'm out of here for following Moses anymore. That was basically the thing. So what did God do? He, he He did something that was masterful. He created, for example, in polygamy in such a way that when the man died, the wife and, and the community decided where this man's wealth would go. Normally, it would go to the oldest son. Not so in polygamy. In polygamy, the group of elders of that community would decide where that wealth goes. And how are they instructed? God said, all the wealth goes to the children of the wife who is least loved. <laughs> so out of his two or three or four or five or 10 or however many wives he had, the community knows, yes, this is the woman he didn't really like. He hardly ever slept with her and, and didn't really spend any time with her kids. You know, he married her with high hopes and doesn't like her. And for years, she's just had a miserable marriage with this guy. And, and so they would say, your kids get everything. Now, what happened? Well, very quickly, polygamy stopped. And the same with divorce. I'm not going to go into that. But he also did the same with slavery. God made rules. And, and, and he said, if you injure a slave, which in those, you look in the Roman Empire, man, they, they would kill him. No problem. 
But, but in the Bible, Jesus, the, the Lord says in Ezekiel, man, if you hurt one of your slave's eyes, he's free. If you even hit him and loosen a tooth, he's free. He says in Leviticus 25, 43, you shall not rule over with rigor, but you shall fear your God. In other words, the slave experience, the guy should not feel like, man, this is horrible. I'm treated so hard. I don't have enough to eat and I'm working 100 hours a week. I just, oh, no. That he was not to feel like you're smashing him with, with so much work. And he, God explains to it, because that's the way you were treated in Egypt. So even though you personally may not have ever been in Egypt, but your forefathers were treated by the Egyptians with rigor, and I heard their cry, and I got them out of that slavery because of the rough treatment. So when you study uh, Deuteronomy and Exodus and Leviticus, the people had to treat their servants like their children. Now, it does break down into foreign slavery versus a Jewish slavery. But in the Jewish culture, a Jew could be made a slave or forced to be a slave. The rabbinical writings explain that if a man became a drunkard and wasn't planting his field, wasn't getting a harvest, and, and they were living in poverty... They could tell that man, you've got to become a slave for six years. Or maybe he was a gambler and lost everything. Or he was just lazy and, and just wasn't doing right with his family. They could take him and his whole family and make them a slave for six years only. But of course, after the six years, they leave wealthy. <laughs> the Bible makes it clear in Deuteronomy 15. Now, when that slave is done at the end of six years, you are to be generous with him, basically giving him six years of wages. I mean, I've asked before people, it's like, how many of you would like to be under a guy and he takes care of all the bills, takes care of all the food, everything is taken care of uh, for six years. And at the end of six years, you get all of the six years of uh, work of that money at one time. It's like, man, I'd love that. Well, that's basically the way it was. Now, the problem with slavery for the slave owner's part, is once a person became a slave, they can decide to stay with you forever. <laughs> and that's maybe not what you want. But often, this guy who's a drunk, he is made to, by this slave owner to no longer be a drunk. He, he forces him to be the right kind of husband. He forces him to be the right kind of dad. And this person becomes the, the best version of himself under the authority of this slave owner. And he may say, I'm afraid if I go back out, I'll be a drunk again, or I'll be the lazy guy again, or I'll be uh, the addicted gambler again and lose it all again, and I don't want to take that risk. And you treat me like your own son. So they actually had to make it in, in Exodus 21, where a guy on the day he's to be free, he goes to the front porch and he holds on to the pillar of the, holding the front porch up. And he has to say this, I love my master and I want to become a bondservant. In other words, a servant for life. Paul called himself a bondservant of Christ. Paul said, I'm the best version of me when I am submitted to to my master, Jesus. And then the master would get, an, get a metal thing and, and knock a hole in his ear and give him an earring. And so when people in the community would see the earring, they would know that man chose to be a servant for life. And it was an honorable position because the guy is in essence saying, I know my limitations. And, and I know without keeping myself under another man's authority, I won't be the person I need to be. So that was the Bible slavery. So if our early forefathers said, well, we're doing the Bible type of slavery, well, they would have been treating these guys like their own kids, 
not in rigor, not selling them like cattle. And it wouldn't have all been one race of people. It would have been multi races of people. So this is where our slavery was unique, but it was also very, very wicked. And I don't think that we can in any way whitewash it. If there's any way we can spin it and say, it wasn't that bad. It was horrendous. Husbands and wives, slaves being separated, their kids being taken away from them like like you would cattle. And uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but I just think we do need to repent. You say, well, that doesn't affect us. That happened... Am I on there? What happened? Oh, Andrew's back there going, oh, with the, he's falling asleep. No, he's not. I'm kidding. But um, Nehemiah in chapter 1, he was praying for Jerusalem, and he was repenting for his forefather's sins. But it, it was as if he, did, he committed them himself. So you can go to the scripture and find this more than once. This is not an unheard of concept to say. Because once the black man was freed after the Civil War, it was almost worse in some ways from them being slaves. Because those who owned slaves and no longer could own slaves, they treated them horribly. And for literally hundreds of years after that, there was a serious racism where they did not want them. And often the black man couldn't buy property. Uh, he, he couldn't vote. I mean, you just go down the line. He was not treated as a human being and as an equal citizen. And that history now is coming back to bite us. And uh, I just think for us as Christians, we need to humble ourselves and, and simply say, yep, our forefathers did that. It was sin. And I apologize. And God forgive us as Americans for such a history. And so in our way of thinking, for the most part, it's like, well, let's just forgive and forget and move forward. But that's not the way many black people think. They're thinking that it hasn't yet been settled. I know that the Japanese that were interned during World War II, it was years, decades later when they gave every Japanese uh, person, and if they were dead, they gave it to their children. Um, I think it was $37,000 or something of restitution. Do you guys, anybody else remember that? Yeah, well, Dennis is Japanese. He remembers it. You can talk to him. <laughs> but yeah, that was something that did indeed happen. So I, I don't know what the answer in this is. I, I know it's definitely ripping things apart, and it, it was is a, a dirty little secret of our forefathers that is causing great havoc uh, right now in our present history. But let's not forget that slavery was going on all the way through history. Matter of fact, let's not forget that the Jews themselves were slaves for 400 years in Egypt, right? Right? Today, in every continent, they do these polls. They know 167 different countries today have slavery. They, they estimate there's far more slaves today than have ever existed in history, mainly because we're seven, people, seven billion people strong. And, and whether you define it as slavery or not, they are being forced to work with rigor and unsafe conditions, and they don't have a choice. They estimate right now in the world about 46 million slaves. They estimate 2 million slaves right now in America. And if that's been the case for the last 10, 20 years, there's actually been more slaves enslaved right now than there ever was in the past history. And the sex slavery, of course, is a huge one now. But also the conquest and people making slaves. 
many countries right now, they're going in and conquering a village and taking these small little boys, shoot their own parents if they're still alive and forcing them to be soldiers now for their um, Muslim army or, or whatever uh, guerrilla warfare they're going to do and terrorize the other African villages. That's, that's a very common thing today. So it's not like something that happened once in our country hundreds years ago, and, and it's never happened again. Like I said, there's, there's people enslaved in our country right now. And it's not a black thing, though. It's multi-cultures are being enslaved. Well, is slavery ever going to go away? No. The future of slavery, we discover in the book of Revelation, all the way up to chapter 19, where it talks about that there would be slaves. In chapter 6, verse 15, and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, single, every slave. There it is, every slave. Every free man hid themselves from the caves and the rocks. So they're in the tribulation period, these slaves. And it talks about it in chapter 13, verse 16. In chapter 18, verse 13, when the great Babylon falls, that the bodies and the souls of men uh, the New American Standard said slaves and human lives, again, are affected by this fall of the Antichrist economic system. And then in chapter 19, verse 18 of Revelation, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. So all the people will be brought before that day of judgment. So what about the slavery that Paul here is talking about? Well, let's understand. In the Roman Empire, they estimate there was somewhere between 40 and 60% of the population were slaves. Now, in Italy in particular, they estimate it being much higher. And then outside of Italy, a bit lower. But if it's somewhere between 40 and 60, let's say 50% of most places were slaves. That's the way they worked. They really didn't have a employee status. <laughs> they had people from captivity, and now their kids and their grandkids have all been born into slavery, and so they're all sort of born into this servant class. And in most places, it wasn't with rigor, because there was half of the population. You didn't want to be, you know, bloodied and bruised and spitting up blood because they're working so much. You have to live with these people and these people are raising your kids. As it turned out in time, many of the slaves became the teachers, the doctors, the lawyers, the accountants. These end up being the people that ran the businesses and they became very uh, well-respected professors in the universities. But yet their status was still that of a slave. Now, don't get me wrong, there were other places and other times, seasons within the Roman Empire where slaves were beaten and, and horribly tortured and, and put to death. But it's interesting that Paul, talking about the slavery, which is about half of the population, he says some very interesting things. Now, first of all, he doesn't see it as unchristian. He actually there in Colossae, we're in the book of Colossians. Well, there in Colossae was a slave owner who was part of the church. His name was Philemon. That little tiny shortest book in the New Testament, or one of the shortest books in the New Testament, Philemon. What had happened was Onesimus, who was a slave of Philemon, had ran away. Long story short, God's divine appointment. Paul meets this guy, leads him to the Lord, and starts discipling him, and Onesimus becomes one of the pastors alongside Paul. And then Onesimus finally says, by the way, I'm actually, my master was a slave owner, or my master was a Christian, Philemon. And Paul says, I led Philemon to the Lord. <laughs> so he writes this letter. So when they received the letter from the Coloss for the Colossian church, they also received the letter from or to Philemon in the hands of Onesimus. And Paul basically says, you need to let this slave go because I need him. 
uh, to be one of my fellow pastors. And by the way, receive him now as your pastor as well. And so they didn't, Paul doesn't see the slavery as, as something that needs to be immediately overthrown. It's this horrible, the worst evil man can, can have. But he does, again, just like with Mary, just like with raising kids, so in the slavery that it would be turned upside down because of the influence of how we're to treat one another as Christians. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for one spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether, what? Slaves or free. We've all been made to drink into one spirit. Galatians 3, 28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for we all are, what? One in Christ Jesus. Do we understand this? For the first time, slaves are sitting next to their masters as equals in church. You didn't have a sense looking at the body of Christ in the Roman Empire like, oh, you're a servant, oh, you're a master, and, and you know, all the masters get the front row seat, all you slaves sit in the back. There was no such thing going on. And then as it took in time, you had slaves that were becoming the spiritual leaders over their masters in the things of the Lord. So it wasn't God's vision, and Paul explains it, that now that you're a Christian, grab a sword and a spear, and we're going to kill everybody who still wants you to be a slave because you're a Christian and you need to be free. In 1 Corinthians 7, listen to this, verse 20 to 24. Let each one remain in the same calling to which he was called. Were you called while a slave? Do not be concerned about it. But if you be made free, rather use it. If you're a slave, don't worry about it. If you, you can do it for sure. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who is called while a free is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in the state in which he was called. Wow. Paul, in essence, is saying, if you're, whatever state you're in, you're married as a married person, serve the Lord. You're single as a single person, serve the Lord. And then he goes to say, if you're a slave, just serve the Lord. Don't, don't worry about the slavery thing. If you're free, don't become a slave. <laughs> Stay free. The, the whole point is, is here is God has it all in control. Now think about it. When Paul's writing this, he's in prison unjustly for years. He wasn't writing, hey, I need all you guys to put an army here together. And if all the hundreds of churches will get their own little uh, militia together, you can come to Rome and free me. He doesn't do that. Paul and his view in prison is saying, I'm a prisoner, not of Rome. I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Isn't that what he said? And I'm in prison because there are people that God wants me to witness to and minister to that never would have heard the gospel otherwise. And you know, Nero, <laughs> the head of the Roman Empire, I'm going to get to see him and tell him personally about Jesus. I mean, if, if I were to say, ask, who would be the number one person you would want to witness to somebody that's important to you in your life? It would be the Apostle Paul, wouldn't it? I mean, there was no better share of Jesus than this guy. And God says, you, the number one testifier uh, on earth, Paul, you're going to go. But in order to get to him, there's a method and the method is you have to be imprisoned to be able to talk to him as a prisoner, to tell him about how you're not a prisoner of him, but you're a prisoner of Christ, and you're actually free. Even though you're in prison, you're really very much free. And that's the way he looked at it. Well, let's look at the particulars now, as we got that foundational stuff out of the way. In verse 22 and 23, bond servants, or for our effect, Employees, 
Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. So he says in a very strong way, like children obeying their parents, you need to obey this person who's in authority over you while they're in authority over you. You need to respect them and obey them as, again, he's going to tell us in a minute, as you would obey God. And, uh, and so while Paul was in prison, he had to submit to his prison guards. While these guys were at work, they needed to submit to those who were in charge uh, over them in the workplace. We all got to submit. That's the bottom line. <laughs> there's, there's no place where we don't need to humble ourselves. There's, we're never going to arrive and say, I am not accountable to anybody. I'm the whatever, the grand poobah, the pope, the king, the president. I am nobody. I'm submitted to no one. It's just never the case because there's always God <laughs> and we're all submitted to him as well. And so he, he, he says, listen, you need to go to work with the mindset, I'm going to do what my boss says. Hey, do you guys remember learning that in your life? I remember having several jobs where the boss said, hey, I want you to do this, this, and this. And I'm like, why do it that way? You know what? I don't need to explain that to you. Just go do what I said. I mean, isn't that the case? The boss doesn't need you thinking when that's his job, he just needs you to shut up and do what he asks you to do. And, and you really, if he can say it in a minute and I do it immediately, that that's going to be something helpful to him. And then he makes it clear. It's not just in the outward you're doing it, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. Or you, you realize God has put this person over me. Now, again, I think we've all experienced God puts real idiots over us sometimes because we need it. We need to get the idiot out of us. And one of the best ways to get the idiot out of you is have a boss who's an idiot asking you to do unreasonable and strange and, and, and his ship's not good. And it's just hard to work at this place with this idiot. But yet God says you're not going anywhere. Because it's not about him. It's about you. It's about your heart. It's about the way you view authority. And one day you're going to be an authority. And when you're an authority, don't be this guy. <laughs> Be somebody different. But you really never know until you get the power what kind of employer you're going to be. Until you're in that place, you don't know. And But yet God is disciplining you before the, it ever happens to help you in that situation. And so the Bible makes it clear that we are not to work only why the boss is looking with eye service, but we're to realize God's always looking and unto the Lord we are working. So there's always been the big discussion through the years of sacred and secular. You know, when we're reading the Bible or praying or worshiping or singing songs or in church, we give God our spiritual worship. But once I leave here and I'm in the world, a different type of person in the world in order to uh, get the job done or whatever. And the Bible erases that, that there is no secular place. Everywhere is sacred. And even at the workplace is a place where God can be worshipped, not worshipped with your praying or singing, but worshipped in how you work. So not just the outside but on the inside, it's like that little kid 
who was told by his parents to go sit on his bed. And he went into his room and his dad looked at him and he goes, I'm sitting on the outside, but I'm still standing on the inside. Well, you can tell, right? When my kids were small and I'd say, hey, you got to clean your room. And, and they'd go in there, start throwing stuff, putting everything under the bed. I'd go in there and, and discipline them. I'm cleaning up the room. No, when you clean up the room with a horrible attitude, you're not obeying me. The attitude is 100% matter in the midst of doing this. I want you to clean your room up with the right heart of submission. So sincere, sincerity of heart with love and respect and authority unto God. In Romans 13, 1 and 2, it says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Do we really believe God's got it in control? Do you really believe God knows every hair on your head by number? That he knows every spirit of the falls to the ground? He's got all of the stars of the universe in his hand and has put them in place and has given them a name, then you're not in a place, whether it's a marriage or as a child to your parents or a person who's having to submit to a certain school teacher or a person having to submit to a certain coach or in the workplace or in the military, that, that God ultimately is challenging you, causing you to grow if you have the right heart as unto the Lord in this whole thing. So our life is to be this witness. So if you're a student, for example, and you come to class late and you rarely get your assignments in on time, and when you do get them, they're not quite completed, and you're getting a D in the class, but yet you say, man, I'm going to be a witness to my teacher. Well, it's probably not going to happen, is it? But if you're on time and you do the best work, the excellent work, and you're attentive and respectful and you get an A in the class, and, and now you want to share your faith with your teacher, do you, do you see the difference in that? In the same way, in, in the workplace or in the military, working hard, you're on time, you do what they say, not half-heartedly, not, not in a way that's not quality, but you're doing exactly what they want, the way they want, and you're putting that work in submitted to them, not sitting around studying your Bible when you should be working, or witnessing to a group of guys when you're all supposed to be working, or, you know, working a little bit and pulling out your memorized, memory, memory verse cards and, and while you're working but to realize that your secular work time is as worshipful as church on Sunday, and you need to work as unto the Lord. Well, finishing up here in verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of your inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. So it's really not about the earthly paycheck. I mean, I would say, as Paul would say, if you can get more money, get more money. <laughs> but if not, don't worry about it. God will take care of your needs. But to understand the real point of it all is eternal rewards forever in heaven. From that faithful servant, the Lord requires one thing, to be faithful. Now, when I think of rewards, is it about money, gold? and you know, No, gold in heaven is the asphalt for the streets. What, what is it? Well, he tells us in Luke 19, 17. He said to him, one of the servants, well done, good servant. Because you were faithful in the little thing, have authority over 10 cities. In the millennial reign, you'll have a larger sphere of um, influence and control under Christ when the thousand year millennial reign. And so he says to the Christians, basically your motivation is, you're going to be able to see, serve the Lord in a deeper, broader way in the millennial reign. And we don't know how heaven's set up, maybe even for heaven. Because there's going to be a new earth and a new heaven after the end of the tribulation period. So earth, even though it's going to get scrapped eventually, we live on it for a thousand years. And 
we're going to be with Jesus in authority as kings and priests unto our God over in that time period. But then there's a new heavens and a new earth. And he basically is saying, you're going to want to serve me in a greater way in that kingdom. And of course, we do know that in that story, there's a guy with one mina or one talent who doesn't do anything with it, but hand it back to him. And he says, you're not going to rule over anything. As a matter of fact, the one talent you have, give it away and give it to the guy who has 10. Well, in verse 25, but he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done. For there is no partiality. So he says on the flip side of the coin, it's not just if you do well, you're going to get rewarded in a positive way. But he says, when it comes to eternal rewards, he said there's also going to be those who suffer loss. We, we talked about this so many times in 1 Corinthians 3, where when you, there's a guy that builds with hay, wood, and stubble, and it says, even though his soul is saved, because the foundation of Christ, nothing can change that. There's no rewards in heaven. It talks about that in 1 Corinthians 13, or 1 Corinthians chapter 3, excuse me. And so the Christians who do a poor job, are, they're not going to be spared any leniency, whether it's by their boss on earth or the judgment seat of Christ in heaven. Let's look at this in 1 Timothy 6, verse 1 and 2, when Paul talks to Timothy. Let as many bondservants that are under the yoke count their masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. And those who are believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those who are of benefit are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort these things. So he says, man, if they're Christian masters, they're, they, they, don't, they haven't been yet convicted to let you go as a slave, then don't, don't say, oh, because he's a Christian, I can take an advantage and do a crappy job. And, and he won't do anything about it because as Christians, he needs to be nice to me. That's, they were doing the reverse psychology. Isn't that the way our brain works sometimes? He's saying, no, no, no. If you have a Christian master, work twice as hard for him that he's a Christian. Don't say, I don't have to work as hard because he's a Christian. And then look at Titus. I love this passage in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 9 and 10 to another young pastor. Exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, stealing, but showing all good fidelity that they may, notice this, adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior in all things. Wow. He actually here, there is a special garment <laughs> of godliness that you're wearing in the, your, in the workplace that's going to be uniquely beautiful, be a unique witness. So he's like, don't be one of those employees that are snapping back at him. Ah, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't, you know, I'll do it, but it's dumb. Don't do that. Don't, don't steal. Boy, that's such a huge problem. Stealing from employees, stealing is the, is the main problem. That's what puts people out of business. You know, I feel I should get a $5 an hour raise, but since I won't, I'll just, when the boss isn't here, I'll just fill up my car with all the products I want and go sell them somewhere else because he should be giving me a raise. I, I've had a few friends that have owned grocery stores and other stores, and they're saying that it can literally put you out of business. You can lose millions a year that way. When I was a carpenter for a few years, I really was learning how to work, and I had a good friend of mine who was a very strong Christian. And on Friday, uh, when we were getting ready to leave for the week, he's like, come on over here. And he's like, okay, take all your eight penny nails and put them in this box. And there was a box of nails, and we took every, don't, don't keep one nail on you, put it away. And then take the 16 penny nails, here's another, take it, and every nail, don't keep one nail. Okay, now we're done for the, the week. Well, I didn't understand that until I started working with other people. And they're like, yeah, I got a side job this weekend. And they fill up their 
thing as full as they can, like 10 times the amount you would normally care working with both types of nails, emptying out the boss's box with nails so they could do a side project without having to buy their own nails. And I remember going, wow, that's, that's stealing. And if every employee of my boss did that every week, which they often did, my boss around noon would have to come and grab the boxes and put them in his truck so they wouldn't do it. So again, these little things, he's saying when we are honest, when we are respectful, when we realize I'm honoring my boss for the Lord's sake and I treat him as I would honor God, I'm honoring this human boss. He says there is a beauty of adornment that really can't be explained. I don't know about you, but I want to witness in so many different realms. And it's hard to get your foot in the door to be this kind of witness. But again, if your best workers are the Christian workers, isn't that the way it should be? And then in 2 Corinthians 5, talking about no partiality and judgment, Paul says we are confident in verse 8, 2 Corinthians 5, 8, we are confident, yes, well, please, rather to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord, amen to that. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present in heaven with the Lord or absent on earth, still in human flesh, to be well-pleasing to him. Isn't that amazing? I want to be as pleasing to God when I'm in heaven, but I want to be that pleasing side by side in my new body in heaven as I am right now on earth. Wow. Wow. And then he says this in verse 10 and 11, very soberly. We must all be fear, behold, be, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, it's important in the Greek, this is the word bima, which is like when an Olympic athlete would be crowned. The other judgment seat is the white throne judgment for non-believers to be cast into hell. This is talking about the, the seat of reward. What kind of reward are you going to get for running the race? And he says that each one of you receive things done in his body according to what he has done, what? Good or bad. So again, in 1 Corinthians 3, it talks about losing reward. And Paul here says, yeah, we're going to stand before God and give an account of all that we've done. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord. Thing. He's the Lamb of God upon the throne. That's not so terrifying. But when you turn the other way, he's the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Terrifying. This is what Paul is saying. He's our gentle, loving Father, but he's also the King of kings and Lord of lords. And therefore, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, fellow Christians, but we are well known to God and also I trust are well known in your conscience. You know how we live and that our testimony of how we live is sure. And the final verse there in chapter four, verse one, masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. So now he's talking to the master saying, hey, you need to do them right. You don't want to work them uh, like a slave, like a non-Christian master would do, not caring about their welfare, not caring about their family, not caring about their health. You need to take all those things into order, especially if they're Christians. But non-Christians will have such a witness. If you have this loving boss, he, he says, well, I became a Christian, and boy, he changed in how he treats all of us slaves now. Now, all of a sudden, he wants to know about our life, he wants to know about our kids, he wants to know about our health, he wants to, he's inquiring about our finances, and, and I'm, he given everybody a raise because he was not paying us right to begin with. And Jesus said it this way in, John, in Luke 6.31, and just as you want men to do to you, you also must do likewise. In Matthew 7.2, for what, with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So, in essence, good or bad, it will be measured back to you the way you have measured it out. And so there's a warning to owners, to managers, to supervisors. Use your authority realizing 
that you're going to stand before the authority and be judged about the authority you had on earth. Did you do it in the right way, in the right place? So the Roman Empire, without a violent overthrow, without a revolution of any kind, but by preaching and teaching of equality of Christ, changed the atmosphere, and slaves at last were indeed set free. Think about the possibility. If every husband loved his wife as Christ loved the church, and the world looks on, that every child submits to his parent, every parent loves his child and teaches them and corrects them and admonishes them in such a wonderful way as the Lord does us. And then to see if every employee submitted to every employer as unto God himself, as why they're working for that person. And then every person in a place of authority, manager, supervisor, owner, whatever, treats every person like a sheep of their pasture, that they equally need to care for them. They're not just a body to be used, but a person to be cared for. Imagine what revival would happen in every city and country. In a lifetime, we would see the mighty working of God as people look upon us. Not what we said yet. We haven't even opened our mouth. But just looking at the excellent spirit, like the excellent spirit in Joseph, Remember, he was a slave. But as a slave, he submitted and became the number one slave. Then Joseph was put in prison. <laughs> but then as a prisoner, he submitted and became the number one prisoner. In the same way, it, what, what testimony God could use in our life if we are consciously living, wives submitting to their husbands as to the Lord, children obeying their parents as to the Lord, honoring their parents, and now employees honoring the Lord by honoring those in power over us. In a colliery passage in Ephesians 6, verse 5 through 9, he says it this way, and we'll finish. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart as to Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With, well, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same of the, from the Lord, whether he is slave or free. And you masters do the same thing to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven. There is no partiality with him. Ah, Lord, we thank you again for this informational message. We enjoy more of the inspirational messages. But nevertheless, when you give us an informational message and we unpack it line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, Lord, we take this information and put it away in the warehouse of our heart, in the warehouse of our mind, and say, Lord, please, in a mighty, mighty way, Lord, let us be a witness before we begin to speak as a witness. Let our light shine before men far in advance before we can talk to them. Let us be the salt of the earth, bringing flavor and thirst and taste to a very tasteless, wicked world. Let us do that now before we ever open our mouth. Here we are, Lord, strangers and pilgrims, becoming more strangers and more pilgrims by the day knowing that standing through Christ probably in our lifetime, for sure in our kids' lifetime, will probably mean going to jail for saying the simplest of things. But Lord, we're not afraid of any of those things. We just want to stand for you, whether we're a slave for Christ or a prisoner of Christ, whatever it is, that we would just be your servant, trusting not in this life as heaven, but in the life to come where we will have our treasures forevermore in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen.